Let's do an intro for everyone in the chat because a lot of people who come and listen to uh, our spaces every Thursday, they're pretty just focused on Bitcoin mining and they maybe or typically don't have like a large knowledge of like the greater ecosystem or the greater space. And uh, I think that introduction to what Galaxy is and does would be kind of helpful to that extent. So maybe Alex, you can kind of kick us off helping us understand what, what Galaxy is and does and then we'll kind of break it down more into your guys' specific roles. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, Will. Um, so Galaxy is a uh, multi-service financial services company uh, operating in the crypto assets ecosystem. And I, I lead research at Galaxy. Um, and we have several lines of business. We have we have um, a large trading and lending business, um, a large asset management business, an investment banking division that helps companies, um, startups, you know, go public or with mergers and acquisitions. Um, and of course, we have a large Bitcoin mining operation that Amanda runs. And um, am I forgetting an entire business? It feels like I am, Amanda. Principal investing. <laughs> oh, yes. We call that a business. But we also do a lot of venture investing off our balance sheet um, at Galaxy 2. And uh, based in New York, founded by Mike Novogratz, um, a lot of tentacles uh, in the ecosystem uh, in general. And um, really fun place to work, I would say. Feels like the center of the universe, this Galaxy we live in. Amanda, you missed anything else? No, I would just say like, you know, like you said, we, we Galaxy as a whole does a lot of different things. They touch a lot of different parts of the industry, which is, is kind of cool. I find that one of my favorite parts about working there is if I have a question on anything, there's kind of an answer for it from someone just because we have so many different business unit lines and everyone is, you know, that I hate, but like crypto focused. So it's, it's a pretty cool um, environment to work in. I also love that um, leadership really just lets you kind of take the lead and run with whatever your respective business unit is. And, and that's helpful um, for me as a, a Bitcoin maxi in Galaxy. <laughs> so, you know, at, on the mining side of things, we we do a few different, um, we have a few different initiatives. We mine on our own behalf. So we're mining Bitcoin for Galaxy, which is a great um, business. We also provide minor finance for clients. So we do that usually in the form of ASIC backed uh, leases and loans for machines. And then lastly, we uh, make strategic investments when it makes sense. So for example, led the round of your wonderful company, Will Compass. Hells yeah. Uh, you kind of brought up a point that I was going to ask you both about. So Amanda, you're obviously a Bitcoin maximalist. You just express that. Alex, I've heard the same thing, though I haven't followed you for as long. Can you kind of walk me through what's like working at a crypto first company while you're being a Bitcoin maximalist as well? Yeah, so you know, I've actually never described myself as a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm definitely a Bitcoiner, um, a diehard one. Um, but you know, look, I, I love the, I love Bitcoin. I love the values of Bitcoin. I think they should be the values of the entire space. Um, but I also, you know, I like following like this whole industry, right? I'm a research analyst at, the, at my core, right? So I can't, you know, I, I'm much more interested in what what will happen than what should happen. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, and sometimes particularly when it comes to Bitcoin, I stray from that sort of objectivity because, um, you know, in my personal life, because I'm, I am a huge advocate of Bitcoin, but, I, you know, we owe it to our clients and to, and to the industry to, you know, go into the space clear eyed and, and, and be objective with our assessments. And, and that's what I love doing too. I'm really an information junkie at my core. So, um, you know, I, I just want to echo, you know, Amanda's point when I joined Galaxy and, and we were both at Fidelity before Galaxy and there's a lot of great people there too, also mostly working on Bitcoin. But, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the whole space. I genuinely am. And, and there's a lot of people at Galaxy that I can work with and rely on to learn about it. And I'm just trying to learn always. Love that. Love that. Yeah. I mean, I kind of fall more in line with what you're saying uh, about like this huge, broad ecosystem to learn about. So that's why here and there, here and there I read about Ethereum mining. Which You know, I, I think one of the really interesting things is I feel like people define Bitcoin maxi in different ways. And it started to have like this like negative thing that goes along with it. But I don't think it necessarily is a negative thing. Like how I describe myself as a Bitcoin maxi is I see the value in Bitcoin and I want to spend all of my time working on Bitcoin, right? And maybe there's things that make sense for, you know, other people to work on, see value in that. Um, and also, also can be very intellectually honest when thinking through like, does something make sense or not? But like defining Bitcoin maximalism, I think is something that we need to do generally because it's definitely taken on this like negative connotation when it shouldn't and doesn't have to. It, it's like the original, right? The, it, it was a negative pejorative pro propagated originally. Um, I think that's probably a redundant statement, negative pejorative. But um, 
I think the concept, as I understand it, when I think about it, and why I say I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, is that it, it that Bitcoin is the only digital asset or only blockchain that should ever exist, right? Whereas, you know, I used to call myself a Bitcoin pragmatist, saying that it was one of you know it was the only one that really mattered. I, I don't think that's true anymore. That it is the only one that matters. Um, but I also am certainly not sure that it's the only one that should exist at all. Um, but I, it's it's certainly my favorite. It's the one that I, you know, I, <laughs> I own the most of any digital asset of Bitcoin. And I, and I don't, I don't dollar cost average into any other asset other than Bitcoin. And I love Bitcoin, right? So that's why I usually say Bitcoiner, because I believe in Bitcoin, I use Bitcoin. Um, and I advocate for Bitcoin. But I, I, I don't think it's that there's some negative, um, if, if other people want to use something else, like that's just on them, you know, and they may have other reasons for doing that. Yeah, I don't think we need to like, change people's minds, right? Like, I feel like they'll naturally gravitate towards what they're interested in. I think the uh, the HODL Twitter avatar guys are the reason that Bitcoin maximalism gets kind of a bad rap. But uh, we won't steer into that conversation. <laughs> I think like the, the larger reason a lot of people don't like multi, like the multi-chain thesis uh, is just because it can kind of threaten Bitcoin. And that's something that really ties into Bitcoin mining super well. Uh, and curious to get both your guys' thoughts on this like the rise of stable coins and is there a correlation with the tremendous drop in transaction fees we've seen with Bitcoin since July uh, because of the rise of stable coins? Uh, Tether's like a 70, 80 billion dollar market, maybe larger than that. Uh, just tremendous volume every day. Of course, there's tons of other stable coins. Do you guys kind of see Bitcoin itself just being threatened by that? And uh, from a mining perspective, what do you think about the like, transaction fees going forward? I know we're kind of jumping right into the deep zone there, but you guys brought up the subject. So curious to get your thoughts. I, I don't think that like declining transaction fees are, for, you know, in the last six months are in relation to stable coins. But it is an important thing to note that, you know, in 2018 and before, all, the vast majority of base trading pairs in the crypto ecosystem were Bitcoin denominated. And that that is no longer the case at all. And and it hasn't been for a while, mostly because of the rise of stable coins. That does put a dampen that does dampen the demand for Bitcoin um, you know, block space and, and transactional volume. Um, and it, it you know used to have to in 2017, even if your end goal was to buy some ICO token, you had to buy Bitcoin, then you had to convert Bitcoin to ETH, then you had to you know, use ETH to contribute to that ECO, uh, ICO. And, and regardless of, you know, our thoughts on that process, it definitely created significant um, transactional demand on Bitcoin. Um, I, but I don't think that's what's changed since July. I mean, I think you've got a lot of people that entered the space and are hodling. I think you've got, um, you know, there, it's hard to ignore the correlation with the the decline in fees and the and the um, decline in price, that's almost always the case. But then price has significantly rebounded since then and fees have stayed low. Another thing to note is that China went offline, you know, significantly for Bitcoin mining and then and that correlated with, you know, coincided with fees declining. And I, I don't know what that means, but, you know, it's something that I can't ignore. Yeah, I also think we're not we're leaving out the rise of like the Lightning Network, too, as an option for people to use um, in, in smaller capacities, right? So we've seen like the the nodes in the Lightning Network can grow substantially. And, you know, maybe that has given less congestion on the main. The topic of um, transaction fees, obviously like it's something that needs to be discussed, right? But I feel like for now for miners, because the majority of their income is based on block subsidies, it's not something that, you know, really like I lose sleep over now. Um, I hope that I am nicely retired <laughs> on a beach somewhere before, you know, someone has to start thinking about that in the future. But it is, you know, the future of the Bitcoin network security is, is one that I think is, is a really interesting topic that no one has had a really good argument for. Yeah, it just just to put a fine point on Amanda's point there, I mean, there, with the exception of like, you know, May of this year, there, there's never been more value outstanding um, waiting to be mined by Bitcoiners. The, the total value of unmined coins is basically higher than it's ever been. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with both of you guys' logic, especially Amanda's last point that there really hasn't been a lot of good arguments for for which way to go. Uh, there's There's been a lot of discussion about like, you know, block size or how to like maximize transaction fees. What will the Lightning Network be able to do with transaction fees? And can you start building applications on top of it like RSK? No one's really had some sort of solid argument yet. And luckily, I think there's a long time before that needs to be addressed. 
or the Coinbase still being uh, pretty high. But something uh, something to talk about for sure. And Alex, your point about China is also super interesting. I kind of want to steer into Amanda's article uh, that she's helped with for Coindesk, talking about some trends going into 2022 as we're wrapping up the year. Uh, trends for Bitcoin mining next year. And Amanda, you made some points about like hash rate doubling. Uh, you also made some points about just kind of the players in the game right now and where they're going. And you made some interesting points about how Bitcoin stabilizes in price. And you might see some players who kind of overextended themselves by predicting higher Bitcoin prices that we're going to see some mergers and acquisitions. Um, could you kind of walk out your thesis there for the audience and then have a few follow-up questions after that? Yeah, absolutely. So we um, at Galaxy, we have a full team. A couple of them are on right now. Um, BZ in particular does a ton of work on looking at public mining companies and um, thinking through, you know, what is the hash rate going to look like? Like, what is what are the announcements that they're making? When are things supposed to be coming online? And that really gives us a lot of insight into where we think the network's going to be now, you know, in a year from now, or, you know, however long those contracts are for. That really helps us think through, like, our own models and where we think just the network is going. So when we think about people starting to get into mining now, right, prices are the highest I've seen in years for co-location spaces. ASICs are the highest price that they have ever been. So there's a lot of new entrants in the market that are, you know, thinking Bitcoin mining, you know, is going to have 80% margins for a long time without having the understanding of as hash rate increases, the competition also increases. And if you're on the high end of that cost curve, you're not going to be able to be, you know, mining Bitcoin at a really good rate compared to someone with super low, uh, someone who's super low on the cost curve. So I think that the natural progression for that, right, is, okay, maybe someone has like a ton of ASICs coming in, but high electricity costs, right, because they're co-locating and someone has a site, but no ASICs that they plan for. The, like I said, the natural progression is, well, people are going to start to to merge. Um, and the space in general is just going to start to merge because how do you, you know, find yourself and, and think about what you have that's different than everybody else? <laughs> Totally. And if, if, I guess a follow-up, maybe a counter to that point that came to my mind was in, in an easy credit environment that we kind of find ourselves in where the dollar is maybe weakening or uh, at the very least interest rates remain pretty low regardless of like the Fed's uh, intention to possibly taper this year. Uh, and, and these Bitcoin miners are mining a harder asset. They might be able to stay afloat a little longer than pe- some people think just because they can get access to these capital markets and then mine a harder asset uh, and turn around and sell it. Do you think that we could kind of see an environment where some of these weaker players are able to kind of stick around just because of the weird macro environment we're in? Yeah, I think I think that, you know, miners can get access to more, you know, debt through their operations. I think one of the best things that has come out for miners specifically has been Bitcoin back loans. And we see more and more companies diving into that as an offering. And that allows miners really long Bitcoin, right? And then also get access to capital to either expand their operation or keep it going. Do I think that this is going to be something that happens over the next like two months? No. Um, but as like hash rate increases over time, I think some people are going to realize that like maybe they're too high on the cost curve and that they're going to have to adjust how they're thinking about like their future. Interesting. Alex, if you want to chime in on any of these points, feel free. I guess another follow up point or question I have is you know, we've, we've seen a lot of people go public this year. A ton of people go public through SPACs, IPOs or mergers or whatnot. Do you think that in 2022... Will that continue or if ha- like have most of the good ones kind of come out already and you know, we might see some weaker ones listing this year, but you know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, lots of thoughts on that. Um, public markets allow for more liquidity and miners need a lot of capital, right, to have the right setups. Um, not only are you prepaying for ASICs most of the time, you're also prepaying for operations. And if you want to scale to a, a way that is like effective, you need a lot of upfront money. So that's why we'll see miners who have access to lots of upfront money or have been around for a while do really well. Like, for example, like Core Scientific, right? Or like Compute North who have been building for a long time and have like that, that you know, foundation, right, so far. Um, I think because these markets are liquid, I think we're going to continue to see public miners, you know, try to, to go at it and become public. I think that um, it's a little saturated at the moment, but I don't think that will stop individuals from, or, or companies from, from trying to get that liquidity that they need to grow their business. Yeah, it's certainly interesting to see how many Bitcoin mining companies have been going public. Yeah, it's been pretty crazy. I think, you know, it's also the one thing that I really love that we track is seeing like, okay, they went public. They said they were going to do these things. Did they actually do them? And that's the thing that, you know, I think gets lost in translation. There's lots of press releases around like what we're going to do in the Bitcoin mining network. But like there's less press releases around what have we done? 
And I'd love to see the trend focus more on like, what have we done versus what are we going to do? Do you think that's more of an aspect of Bitcoin mining always trying to be secretive, Bitcoin mining players always trying to be secretive, or is it more like people are failing to meet those expectations? Um, probably a combination of both. But I would say when you know public miners are making announcements, it's for, I don't want to say to pump their stock, but here we are. Alex, I don't know. You. Truly. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I think, yeah, it's a good point because obviously Bitcoin miners are incredibly secretive. They need to be, right, because they're, they're in a highly competitive business. Um, to, you know, maybe the power arrangements they have are pre- preferential and they, they don't want, you know, people to know about, you know, to come and take those arrangements. And, um, and also, you know, Bitcoin's a bearer asset. So, I mean, like everything in the Bitcoin industry, like it's, it's dangerous from a cybersecurity standpoint. Um, and that, that poses a really interesting clash with the transparency of public markets, right? Public companies have a lot of ongoing disclosure requirements. And so, you know, I think a lot, it, it's got to be tough. You know, I, I, I don't operate myself at public mining company and, and I can imagine that that's, that's an ongoing, you know, tension trying to be, you know, fulfill your obligations of transparency as a public company while also, you know, staying competitive. And um, I mean, look, public markets, um, that liquidity comes from capital formation and transparency and, and you have to be able to, tell the world what you're doing, but also markets are forward looking, right? So I think that's part of the reason you get a lot of forward looking statements um, out of these companies because they, you know, people are, you know, the markets are efficient and they want to price in future earnings growth. And and that's, that's (laughs) something that's really, really interesting with Bitcoin considering how competitive it is. And if we think about, you know, the matchup public miners are talking about, even those are not like compared apples to apples, right? So Karim and, and Brandon on our teams recently came out with an article on how, how to calculate the cost to mine a coin. And when you look at it, we have we propose three different ways, right, of how to how to calculate that cost. And the reason why we have three different options is because there's a lot of different strategies within mining. Do you just co-locate? Do you own your own facilities? Are you including every single cost that you have in there? And when you look at all the public mining announcements and, and the cost that they're they're saying they're mining a coin at, it's literally not consistent across the board. So I think what we'll find is that analysts will start to get much more smarter that are covering these public mining companies. Right now, it seems like it's a little, we've seen like a few analysts start to cover it. And and I've talked to a couple of them and they definitely are on like the right track to like getting up that learning curve. But mining is pretty weird. It's a pretty steep learning curve. And I think it will just take a little bit of time to get people used to it. But once that does happen, I think it will become obvious what public miners are, are like, have a good setup, have a good operation, have good strategy and what miners don't. Yeah, speaking of people going public and Bitcoin mining, uh, where's Galaxy at right now in terms of its position in the market and maybe some information on where you guys are going as a, as a mining firm? Yeah, so, you know, the first year, this was the first year that we launched Galaxy Mining. And I think it was a really great year to build our foundation. So putting up the right, you know, process and procedures and what we think we want to do, right? Creating a strategy. And Brian, who's on this right now, has been very influential in all of that. Um and I think next year, it's really scaling for us, right? So infrastructure takes time. And I think that that's something that we all learn as we start to become Bitcoin miners, right? Um, and I think that there's a lot more that can be done. So scaling our prop mining, scaling our MiFi business, um, continuing to look at strategic investments, all of those things will continue to grow. And then all providing insight um, as we can into the industry from the research that we do. Totally. No specifics to share with you, Will. Oh, you, should know, no. you should know better. <laughs> I do, but you know, I got to ask. You got to try. The old journalist to me. Uh, just going back to the article, uh, which I thought everyone should go read. It's on Coindesk. If you can manage to navigate their new web page, it's, just, it's worth reading. Uh, but kind of going through some trends for next year, predictions. Uh, one thing that came up, and I don't think you commented on it directly in the article, but uh, I have a feeling you agree with it. It's just like more hash rate coming online next year, uh, specifically that's going to double. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering internally, how much do you guys track kind of the geopolitical situation with Bitcoin mining? Uh, it's difficult to track that stuff, but you know, we've saw China's down, uh, Kazakhstan limited how much power Bitcoin miners can use. And uh, there's some miners moving away from that area. Uh, do you guys kind of keep track of all that stuff internally? And do you have anything to share on thoughts and how that's going to kind of develop going into the next year? Yeah, we, we definitely keep track of that. And I know that we, we really lean a lot also on Alex and the research team, right, to keep us up to date with certain things that are going on. Um, but I think most of us are are constantly interested in what's going on in Bitcoin around the world. And I think that also helps us think through who and where can we offer some of our products to. So we tend to be, you know, slightly conservative in, in who and, and where we're offering products to 
for now until there's some more flushing out. Like obviously Texas has come out as like a, hey, like we love Bitcoin miners, right? So that's a great location. And um, I think, you know, New York has kind of went the opposite way. Um, but we are constantly thinking about geopolitical risk when it comes to mining. I think regardless of, you know, geopolitical risk, I, I still don't think that any of us could have predicted last year that China was going to completely shut down mining. Um, so I think you can track it to a certain extent, right? But then the world just happens. And, you know, Alex does a lot of work on understanding like legislation and regulation. Um, so I'm sure he has some comments on this too. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think Bitcoin is a geopolitical force today and it's going to become, it's only going to become bigger um, for a variety of reasons, including mining as a big part of that. It makes it look, I mean, st stacking the corn is a great tradition of privacy and individual sovereignty, but it can also be one for an Asian state, right? And I think, or, or a jurisdiction. I mean, I think something like what's been happening in Texas, as an example, is, a, is really demonstrative of that, that jurisdictions see the jobs, they see the capital, they see the mind share they can attract by being, you know, supportive of this industry. And, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, like, uh, you know, disfavored nations can also do the same, but um, this is a, 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 a way to participate in a global industry that, that supports a decentralized and open monetary good, right? And there's a lot, if you just think about the, you know, the, the nations of the world and how diverse they are, you know, it, it, particularly in their geopolitical positioning and, and alliances, I, I really think that we'll start to see more of what we used to call the non-aligned movement, but sort of the, the um, you know, the BRICS countries and, and um, you know, those countries that aren't particularly aligned with China or the U.S., either of them, I think we'll start to see more, more interest in Bitcoin mining over time, especially when you see um, what I think really positive outcome um, for a country like El Salvador uh, in, in adopting Bitcoin. And I think, I think other nations are going to see that and, and view it really positively as a way to gain some independence. Yeah, Alex, your point paired earlier with Amanda's comment about the shrinking uh, profit curve for Bitcoin mining makes the question a little bit more interesting, I think. So if you consider that El Salvador or some of these other smaller nations are getting into the Bitcoin mining game at the same time as the US and Canada are kind of sucking up all this hash rate by leveraging uh, easy money and the fact that they're closer to the money printer, I think it makes it kind of a harder sell for them to kind of get into Bitcoin mining just because of how capital intensive it is. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, in a, in a year, two years, three years from now, if some of these countries try to get into it and then they just end up in a, in a tough spot uh, where they can't really make Bitcoin mining profitable. How do you see, I guess my, my general question is, how, how do you see that adoption curve taking place among different countries? Is it really just that, that easy kind of copy paste El Salvador's model and just jump into the boat? I mean, you definitely need access to capital, but, but right now, I mean, capital is more abundant than it's ever been. So, um, I mean, you see that with, with El Salvador's bond and, and you see it with MicroStrategy's repeated offerings to raise capital and, just how, how easy that's been for, for entities. I think, it, you know, there, there's obviously peculiarities here that are nation state specific. Um, but, you know, even though it's more competitive than it's ever been, I mean, I, I think it's still very compelling. I do think that, you know, that the, the rise of is going to be interesting to watch, right? But going back to the article, well, because I was just like skimming it as you guys were talking about that. I thought it was an, I thought Aeon did an awesome job pulling together everyone's, um, themes into one location. The one thing that we missed, though, in this article is just the, the natural progression of the energy sector starting to mine Bitcoin. And I think that's going to be something that happens that we'll see continue to happen over the next year. Um, and I think that could influence how, you know, nation states start to adopt Bitcoin. If you have large energy companies using this as an alternative stream of resource and, you know, countries and states and locations are dependent on those energy sources, it might be potentially a little bit of like a shift in how we think about Bitcoin mining. Yeah, totally. I think that's a really urgent point. And two of your alums from the Galaxy Digital team are jumping on the Compass live stream uh, tomorrow to talk about how Bitcoin mining can soak up excess energy everywhere. So be sure to go and listen to that tomorrow on our YouTube stream. Uh, it's Amanda's old co-workers. So I'm pretty excited for that chat. Uh, I kind of want to open up the floor a little bit more to Alex's side business, talking about all the different coins that you kind of cover through the research team and how that relates to Bitcoin mining and how that relates to Galaxy itself. Uh, Alex, can you kind of walk us through some of the research reports you guys have put out this year and how that fits into Galaxy's playbook? 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, look, broadly, Galaxy Digital Research, we're focused on um, unpacking and, and, and creating insights for our clients about the cryptocurrency industry, technologies, trends, markets, um, and, and, and I'll throw in, you know, policy, right? So regulation and legislation. You know, we spend a lot of time on Bitcoin. One thing that's interesting is that our clients who are predominantly um, hedge funds, crypto funds, VC funds, endowments, um, pension allocators, they, uh, you know, for the most part, they get Bitcoin. At least, you know, it's some of the core principles. Um, and so I, I write about Bitcoin um, when um, when there's something, you know, really notable that changes sort of the way people should be thinking about it. We wrote a lot about China. Um, we wrote about Taproot. Um, I wrote about... Um, we wrote about El Salvador, right? I, I think, which I, interestingly, and I think maybe, maybe we spotted that well. I mean, those, I think are, to me, those are probably the three biggest Bitcoin stories of the year. Um, and, and, but we also, I mean, we, we cover the entire space. I mean, we, we, we spend a lot of time writing about policy as it affects not only Bitcoin, but um, DeFi and, and, and other networks like Ethereum. We spend a lot of time talking, we, you know, we wrote about layer one smart contract platforms, which I think is a reasonable way to sort of characterize our view in, the, in that report, which we called Ready Layer One, um, which I see uh, Walt, who was in the audience for a little bit, he had, was had an instrumental, uh, was instrumental in putting that report together. We basically said that, you know, Bitcoin has established itself. It's a macro um, phenomenon now. It, it's the most decentralized and resilient blockchain. And it, it frankly does what it what it set out to do um, which is not something you can say for a lot of the other blockchains. Um, and that, you know, you know, Vitalik and other Bitcoiners at the time who want to do different things with Bitcoin, you know, the community rejected those approaches and that resulted in, you know, the creation of Ethereum. And and we view Ethereum as more of a technology platform. And there are many sort of copycats. I mean, some of them are different and they make different design choices to achieve different ends. Um, but Ethereum sort of commits that first you know, original sin against the decentralization ethos, although it's still notably more decentralized than mo most or all of its competitors, right? But the addition of the EVM and, you know, um, and smart contracts, staple smart contracts, makes it much more cumbersome to operate a, a node for, for an average person, which, which has an impact on the level of decentralization. But fundamentally, we think of it as a general computing platform and, and technology is highly disruptable. Whereas, you know, monetary networks are, 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 are incredibly sticky, right? And so I think that was a, that report was a good example where we, you know, we're talking about all these other... I mean, we wrote about like 10 or 11 different smart contract platforms from Avalanche and Solana to even Tezos <laughs> and Cardano. And um, it, <laughs> what did you write about I, Cardano? I mean, we basically said that it doesn't work um, for the most part, that it's mostly vaporware. And I think that's true. I think that's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, Will, if you're holding Cardano bags, you know, be wary. Um, but I There's think that's... financial that, advice, Alex. That's, Not that's financial advice. I yeah. think that's the way... I mean, that's the way we think about it, which is that Bitcoin sort of stands alone among this, you know, gr frankly, growing ecosystem of, of public blockchain networks and, and uh, look i'm fascinated by this growing ecosystem and the different designs that that teams are making i mean there's a whole bunch of negative out there there's no doubt i mean you're never going to find something as pure and decentralized um and and you know like it, having achieved its primary goal as bitcoin you just you just won't find that but you know there's other shit people want to do on blockchains that bitcoiners just don't want to do on on block on bitcoin and and I don't want to do it on Bitcoin, right? So, like, the design space is much broader in, in, in than what Bitcoiners want to, you know, subject our layer one blockchain to. And I think that's good. Um, so, I mean, that's, I don't know, that's kind of how we think about it. We've done a whole bunch of stuff. We wrote a lot about layer twos, a lot about lightning um, in, in there as well. And I, I, I'm a huge supporter of the lightning network in general. Um, that includes the people that work on it and the companies building on it. You know, I run, I think I run three three nodes now, only one of them I actually operate lightning channels on. But, you know, I, I mean, I think that's a huge, I think making Bitcoin easier to operate and, and transact is, is, is really powerful um, and, and is going to be really important. But um, we also write a lot about markets. I mean, we write a lot about um, the different segments of this crypto market and, and how they're performing and how Bitcoin is performing against tech and how it's 
how its correlations to you know inflation expectations are looking and you know spend a lot of time thinking about the sort of macro investing ecosystem and, and markets because Bitcoin is held by major institutional investors. So it, it, this thing, you know, it trades like a like an important global macro asset and that has, you know, implications for for how it how it trades and, and so we focus a lot on that too. Totally. And love those answers. Um I want to just give everyone a second here. If you want to ask a question, feel free to send up a request and we'll uh, have some QA for Amanda and Alex. Alex, just to ask a follow-up question before we do that, though, I wanted to get an understanding from you on how you kind of think about Bitcoin's settlement layer, specifically like Bitcoin mining and proof of work versus some of these other chains that you guys have been doing research on. Uh, Just to kind of make that question a little bit more concise, if you're looking at some of these smart contract platforms or typically using proof of stake or some sort of similar system where there's, you know, coins are are the reason that these things work. Yeah, you you have... weighted stake in the system that enables the system to have some sort of security. Bitcoin doesn't operate that way. Bitcoin operates very differently. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of momentum around Ethereum and proof of stake and some of these other systems right now. But from your research perspective, how do you kind of think about those coins and Bitcoin at this point? Are they, they truly separate? Uh, and, and even institutional investors are even thinking of these things as two separate entities at this point? Yeah, they are, they are thinking them, of them as separate. The way I would characterize it, um, Will, is that in proof of work, computation controls the you know block production, and in proof of stake, capital controls block production, right? And capital is obviously very important in Bitcoin and proof of work. I mean, we've talked a lot about how expensive it is to set up a Bitcoin mining operation. No doubt, capital has an advantage in terms of you know gaining access to participate in block production although i will point out that what compass does is really fascinating on that regard specifically of democratizing access to block production in proof of work um but i mean by definition like you know capital controlling the system it's one thing for capital to be important it's another thing for capital to govern the actual base layer the consensus mechanism of the platform itself um, and and I think that has pretty pretty interesting and, and perhaps negative implications for um, the democratization and, and and frankly openness and even censorship resistance of a lot of these systems that are proof of stake. It's particularly bad when a, a coin launches with um, that uses proof of stake where the supply is highly concentrated. And and frankly, this is one of the ironies that we found. And that sort of you know it's not like we didn't know it, but you know as we do our research, these ideas sort of gel and, and form and 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 when when we were looking a lot at proof of stake you know it, it becomes much more of an issue like i said when they launch and their supplies are highly concentrated but if you look at the the sort of newer class of smart contract platforms their supplies are significantly more concentrated than even those that launched you know in, in either the ico era or ethereum itself i mean in retrospect the ico except for the fact that many of them were outright scams uh, but some weren't, and and the ones that weren't, like their supply distributions are significantly better than the than the networks we've seen launched more recently. That's a consequence of securities laws in the United States, in particular, which basically ruled the ICO illegal. And so these projects instead went to accredited investors, mostly venture capitalists, um, to raise funds. And but the difference was that the you know quote unquote cap table of these networks went from being thousands of individuals contributing Bitcoin or or ETH to four or five deep pocketed venture funds. And so when those networks launch, they launch with, you know, four or five parties controlling a significant portion of the supply. And when you couple that with the fact that that capital earns a return through staking, right, that they um, that they are, are privy to the transaction fees and, and block rewards um, that, that are as blocks are produced, they're, they're much less likely to sell those coins because there's several ways for coins for wide distribution, one of which is for large holders to cash out, right? And But if you can just do nothing and earn 5 6 7% annualized returns, you're less likely to sell those coins, which means that the um, the systems, it's possible that the system centralizes even more over time. So it's a particularly bad mechanism, proof of stake for coin distribution, which I think is is one of the things that we found. Um, I mean, look, most of those networks, they know, they know that that's an issue. Um, and they are going to they claim to try be thinking about how to mitigate that. Um, but, you know, the, it remains an ongoing problem. I mean, proof of work is 
by definition, a much more egalitarian method to um, distribute supply. Um, and so, you know, I, I think from a settlement standpoint also, which I think was your original question, Will, um, you know, Bitcoin offers the, re- the most robust settlement, you know, finality, I think, in my opinion, a combination of both the resilience of proof of work, but also the the reliability of the protocol itself, right? I mean, there, there are some interesting new, um, you know, finality, instant finality technologies, such as the proof of history that Solana uses that, that do have, you know, strong settlement assurances, except that that network, you know, runs into problems all the time and has to be rebooted, right? <laughs> right? Which is not, not a small caveat. I'm not intending that as a mere asterisk. Um, so, you know, on balance, I think by far the proof of it also Bitcoin's general robustness makes it the most uh, reliable from a settlement assurances standpoint. Yeah. And I love that you brought up proof of work as a distribution network as well. I think that that's something in the white paper most people to kind of gloss over. Uh, that was a, a key reason for mining, uh, not just for the proof of work and for the settlement assurances, but also to distribute coins. And that's kind of the uh, argument I think Amanda was alluding to in uh, the CoinDesk article that she's quoted in. That you know that cost curve is very steep and cuts people off if you don't do it correctly. Uh, so miners are always racing against that. Um, I see that I jumped up on stage, and I want to open up the floor to more people jumping up on stage to ask Amanda and Alex some questions. Of course, they're both here from Galaxy Digital, or Amanda runs the mining firm, uh, mining arm of Galaxy, and Alex runs the research lab there. I, I'd also encourage everyone to go check out the research reports. They're really fantastic. And since we got Christmas break coming up, there's a good amount of time to sit down and read them. Uh, hey, Sean, how's it going? Good, guys. How's it going? Yeah, Will, you're, you're assuming that um, everyone just gets to sit around and do nothing all Christmas break and, and read <laughs> about mining. mining. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> No. You're on spaces all day. You can definitely sit down and read the oh, yeah, Ready Layer One report. Just hashing away, Amanda, uh, Alex. Good to see you guys. Thanks. Um, from an institutional perspective, um, uh, where are we at in the in the institutional education spectrum in terms of proof of work versus proof of stake and and Bitcoin as as an, an energy um, layer that that's supporting the purest form of monetary that we've ever that man has ever known, uh, as opposed to um, institutions being interested in proof of stake protocols because they see the potential to make a, a high fiat return in, in the short term? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question for sure. I mean, it, it, you know, I frankly, I don't think we're far enough along in, in telling the proof of work story, but we've definitely made progress. Ironically, I think the the Ethereum's plan move to proof of stake actually benefits the story here. I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm worried about the, the sort of media relations around Bitcoin's proof of work when that happens. But it benefits the story because it, it again just shows that Bitcoin stands alone, right? It's it's not it shouldn't be thought of in the same thought necessarily as these other assets and protocols. Um, but look, I mean, a lot of the the institutional allocators look at cryptocurrency investing as um, sort of a venture bet, right? Still, and and I think the digital gold narrative is really permeated. Also, it, it is shifting a bit. But I love the point about Bitcoin as, you know, an energy coin, right? And, and, and obviously, on the ground, major um, progress has been made in, 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 in um, pro- propagating that view of Bitcoin, you know, from companies like Compass and, and GAM and, and the others that do, you know, that, that, that work with and, and Steve, you know, Steve Barber's company that work with energy companies and grids to convert excess energy into Bitcoin. Um, so that that's clearly been working. Um, one thing I'll point to is like, right, New York was going to try to ban this and there was huge pushback. Um, they were going to try to ban proof of work mining. And there was a huge pushback from the electrical union um, that caused it to fail, which I, I thought was really great um, to see. So, I mean, some progress is being made, I would say. Institutions are savvy. I mean, they, the ones that are, I don't know, I should say there's a range of, of, of crypto IQ among the institutional investing class. But some the most savvy do get it, and they they understand the difference. And you know whether or not they choose to pursue, you know, a venture style tech bet in some new altcoin versus you know um, you know allocate to Bitcoin um, or Bitcoin mining. That's really up to them. But but they but the IQ level is increasing. Yeah, I mean, I think both really great questions. The first, I would say, when we think about proof of stake and proof of work, there's obviously trade offs to both, and I think that range for security and solidity. But I think the problem is, is putting Bitcoin in the same bucket as the other ones. It it never can be in the same bucket, right? So that's the thing that I think is a little bit different. There's been a ton of work done over the past year from, you know, miners in general to get the word out, like Alex was saying. And I know there was, this was a contentious topic, but 
the Bitcoin Mining Council also really helped to show a number to institutional investors that says like, hey, this is the amount of energy being used. It's not a big deal, the amount of energy that's being used. And hey, here's a sustainability mix of, you know, 33% of the network. And having those metrics and those data points to point to, I think real investor is more comfortable with Bitcoin mining. At the beginning of this year, there really wasn't, you know, you could say like, oh, well, a lot of miners use like sustainable energy. And that doesn't really go far. But when you have like numbers and data that you can point to, I think you can get people more comfortable with, with the whole aspect of proof of work quicker. Yeah, that's a great point. I forgot to shout you out for that, Amanda, because you were instrumental in setting that group up. And I know a lot of Bitcoiners were um, hesitant about it and, and sort of, you know, worry that the incentives, you know, become perverted. But I, I, I absolutely hear that when we talk to, and I talk to a lot of our clients on a regular basis, they make a huge point of, I mean, ESG, whether we like it or not, is an important and, and, and lasting part of the institutional investment narrative. And, and through partly through the efforts of the Bitcoin Mining Council, they're also just learning how energy works, right? <laughs> right, and like understanding that actually energy usage isn't the isn't bad, right? That it's much more about if you care about you know climate change, for example, then what really matters is the emissions. It's the energy mix, and and Amanda and the, she helped form there at the Bitcoin Mining Council have been really instrumental in, in in propagating that information out. Yeah, no, it's awesome the how far the industry's come and just from an uh, energy education in the last year has been amazing too. And just from Galaxy's perspective, Amanda, from the mining operations, are, are you guys like focused more on Bitcoin mining as, a, as proof of work or, or are you subject and, and beholden to kind of your institutional investors um, that, that are looking for a lot of the other stuff going on as well? So our team focuses on Bitcoin mining. Um, there are different parts of Galaxy that are looking into staking and different coins. But I think, you know, there's a specialty that comes along with Bitcoin mining. And so we've really tried to formulate a really great team around that. Um, and that's what we've been focusing on. So ESG has clearly been one of the major topics of the year. To get into that market for a second, because what Alex said, I just wanted to piggyback off of him. I don't think that people realize how big the ESG market currently is and how big it's going to grow in terms of investment. And Bitcoin miners are actually a great investment for ESG investors. So if we think about over the past half decade, ESG has emerged as one of the largest megatrends. And every year, more than $3 trillion flow into the $30 trillion ESG market. That's a lot of capital, right? And so Bitcoin miners can totally use that that bucket of capital in a way that makes sense. So I think it's actually an opportunity versus a drawback. Love that. Yeah, I love that perspective because I think uh, a lot of the people who are just getting introed into Bitcoin mining it might be their second thing they've done after maybe buying Bitcoin on an exchange and then like running a node or uh, self custodying their Bitcoin. They're not really thinking about it from like that larger macro perspective. Uh, it can kind of get lost um, with how, how big those things are. Sean, I appreciate those questions. Um, I know Amanda and Alex have to run in a few minutes here, but so uh, this will actually be our last question. Again, I can't thank you both enough for jumping on the stage, talking to us about Galaxy, what's happening uh, with the mining arm and what's happening at the research team. Again, go check out both of these two people's uh, work. You can find both of them here, obviously on Twitter, uh, and then go check out Alex's research reports. But for Newly Fish, you got one last question for you. Um, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to ask, where's, where's a good place, uh, Amanda, to, to, to find information on who's actually involved in the uh, Bitcoin Mining Council? There's a website. So it's BitcoinMiningCouncil.com and you can see um, who, what miners have joined that. And so every quarter we come out with a new report that shares you know, data on energy usage. Um, so hopefully it's, it's helpful to some people, certainly not all. <laughs> but I think it's, it's generally a good resource for, for people. Um, and it also gives more insight into the industry. I think the one thing that we don't appreciate is three to four years ago, there was actually no data whatsoever that was, you know, reliable in mining. Um, and so having access to data like this, I think really helps shape the industry a little bit more. Definitely. And thank you. I probably could have uh, Googled for that website. No, it's all good. I mean, there's <laughs> Google, there's Twitter spaces, however you want to get your, uh, <laughs> your information works. Sure. And, and I did want to mention, uh, you know, regarding those last questions about the ESG and the, um, I, you know, the, I don't know that, that necessarily those questions were that informed because there are major ESG companies that are investing directly in Bitcoin mining. Yep. And, uh, yeah. So I, I think that's worth letting people know. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I will say, I think that 
people who show up to Compass spaces just to shit on Compass probably don't have the best interests in mind. So that's all all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, and, and personally, I, I don't measure my earnings in uh, dollar value. The sets. You know, I was talking to um, I was talking to this guy recently who really changed my mind on home mining. Um, he was saying I home mine not because I think I'm going to be instantly profitable. I home mine because I want access to non KYC Bitcoin, and I think that is an incredible um, option, right? That Compass provides. The other thing that I think is really cool is that if you think the Bitcoin price is going to appreciate over time, which I think we're all like-minded that we think that is the case. If you're able to hold your Bitcoin now, it will actually be very profitable in the future. Mando, how early are we um, in terms of Bitcoin mining from an institutional perspective and, and overall industry perspective? I mean, you've been around a while, right? So yeah. so are are we still early or are the institutions here and we've done become financialized and it's just another major industry that, that's going to be dominated by energy players from now on? I think that there are some institutions here, but I think there are some, there's still plenty to go. Um, the learning curve is difficult. So the more like data and information we could put out there to help people learn, I think is, is, is really useful. So that's why I think a lot of the work that Alex and team is doing is, is incredible for the space. Look, Galaxy is always trying to bridge the gap, right? Between those two worlds, between like the Bitcoin world and speak that language, then also the institutional world. And I think a lot of, um, the work that we do hopefully helps with that and it will eventually inject more more capital into you know the bitcoin and bitcoin mining space and help that network grow some awesome hopium to end the day on i think amanda's totally spot on there there's a a lot of room to grow but we also have a lot of awesome people already at the party Uh, amanda alex thank you both so much for sticking with us kind of walking through the full spectrum of galaxy if you missed part of this we're gonna upload it on the compass podcast so you can come back and listen to it don't worry we'll clip out that uh, unflattering part from a few minutes ago but no worries there appreciate both of you and we'll talk soon thanks yeah, well thanks well